first uh, saw Michael play in high school, uh, you know, I knew he had exceptional talent. You could tell that he didn't have the science or the theory of the game down yet, but you knew that he had a talent that was raw. And when he came to Carolina, he had so much confidence that I thought I was a freshman and that he was a, 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 you know, a senior. He's very eager to learn. And he also sought out the best players around him. And I was the best player on the team. And he always wanted to compete. You know, we would practice two hours, two and a half hours. I'm drenching in sweat. I'm ready to go back to the dorm, take a shower and relax. And here comes Michael. He's pushing me back on the floor, asking me, where are you going, young fella? He always used to call me young fella. He said, where are you going? Let's go play. So he just wanted to measure himself. And, uh, you know, and I knew he had a lot of confidence. And I knew once he got the science and the theory down uh, that he was going to be hard to deal with. Hated to lose. Michael hated to lose at anything. It could be backgammon. It could be chess, a game of cards. It was like losing in the NBA Finals if he lost in anything. So he loved to compete. Uh, he had tons of confidence. Some people mistake that for arrogance. Not a percentage of arrogance in Michael. It's just thousands and thousands of, per, uh, of percentages of, of confidence. I knew he was going to be a, an all-star NBA player. But I had no idea that he could be arguably the best player that's ever played. Before. Michael was like a mosquito, you know, he was, he's like a fly. He's always around, you know, you swipe him away and he'd come back. You know, you'd be sitting down in the cafeteria in the dorm and he'd come by and he had huge hands. Michael had, he has hands like a frying pan, okay? And he would come by and smack you in the head. You know, he's just always doing stuff to get you attention. Like, you just, you just want to get up and kick his ass. You know what I mean? But you knew that he just had this special, innate spirit about him off the court, always talking, jive, wanting to compete. Uh, whether it was backgammon, it didn't matter. Uh, he loved to, to, to joke. Uh, and he didn't mind. He didn't care if you were older than he or younger. He, just, he was the same. On the court, uh, the smile went off. You could see in his eyes that it's, it's basketball time now. Now, he could have some fun on the court, but you could see the contrast immediately. His eyes, he, his, he had these wrinkles in his head. He, he's like a bull blowing smoke out of his nose. And he just, he just wanted to kill. It was like a killer instinct. And it didn't matter who was on the floor with him. If you were better than him, and I said in, in the documentary, I was better than Michael Jordan for about two weeks. Because once he got the theory down and Coach Smith gave him the, the science of the game and he learned how to play within the team and take advantage of his strengths, there was no looking back, no looking back. There, there's a big joke that said, who's the only one that's held Michael Jordan to 14, 16 points? And it's Coach Dean Smith. When you look at guys like Phil Ford, who played for Coach Smith in the 70s and early, in the late 70s, Phil Ford was rookie of the year when he came to the NBA. Probably only averaged like 12 points. Walter Davis, uh, the year before Phil Ford, was rookie of the year for the Phoenix Suns. So Coach Smith gave you all the tools. And so when Michael became unhinged, when he, we didn't have any control over his game, he got to the NBA. He thought it might be a chance for him to flourish individually. Okay. He also went to a team that was not that good. They had some good individual players, but the organization, uh, the team, they were not in sync. And Michael tried to do too much. 
he tried to do everything because he wanted to win, and they were not winning, barely making the playoffs. And so when he hurt his foot, he realized that, you know, the wear and tear of an 82-game schedule versus a 32-35 game college schedule. And also, I think it took, uh, you know, Doug Collins to realize that Phil Jackson may have been the answer uh, for Michael as far as playing the team game, making him realize that he didn't have to do everything all the time. And I think that's when he started to really become a mature NBA player in the mid eighties or so, right when they started to struggle with the Detroit Pistons, when they got Pippen, when they got Horace Grant, Michael trusted, uh, he trusted the triangle offense. Uh, he never had that experience before in the NBA. Under Coach Smith, yes, three years there. But on the NBA where it's a little different, a little bit more business, the media is on you, you're under the microscope, he finally started to trust Steve Kerr and the system. In 1977 or 78 or somewhere around in there, the Lakers made a trade with the Cleveland Cavaliers, okay? They traded Don Ford, uh, Chad Kench, and some money for Cleveland's future number one draft pick, which just happens to be 1982. They made the deal in 77. Cleveland was at the top of the league. They were making the playoffs every year. So no one expected Cleveland to take a sparrow down to the bottom of the league, okay? So 1982 comes. The Lakers, via that, 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 that trade five or six years earlier, had Cleveland's number one pick. That's how they got it, okay? Back then, we didn't have the lottery and all the, the systems that are in place now. So the process was the team who had the worst record, which at the time were the L.A. Clippers, and the team who had the number one draft pick, they tossed a coin to see who had the number one draft pick. The Lakers tossed a coin. They got the number one draft pick, and they had choices. Ralph Sampson, the 7'4 center who played at Virginia, decided to stay in school for his senior year. That opened up the door for me big time. Otherwise, I probably would have stayed in school. If Ralph Sampson had come out, I probably would have been projected to go third or fourth in the 1982 draft behind Dominique Wilkins. Uh, behind Terry Cummins, and behind Ralph Sampson. Okay, Ralph Sampson stays in school. Jerry West does not need a prolific score like Dominique Wilkins. Dominique Wilkins was called the human highlight film. The Lakers already had Kareem, Jamal, Wilkes, uh, Bob McAdoo. They had just won two championships. They really didn't need the, the pick, to be honest with you. Jerry West wanted someone that would fit into Magic Johnson's system, a guy that could run a team player that happened to be me. That's how I became a Laker. Usually, when you're the number one draft pick, you're going to the worst team in the league. And when you do that, there's a lot of pressure on the number one draft pick. When he goes to a team that hasn't been in the playoff, uh, you take a current day player like Zion, you know, a lot of expectation when he goes down to New Orleans. I go to Los Angeles. They just won a championship the year before against the Philadelphia 76ers. In fact, they won in 80, 1980, and they won in 1982. They don't need me. They really don't. So they just happened to, you know, have the pick. They chose me. I really didn't feel as much pressure going to Los Angeles had I gone to uh, the Clippers or a team at the bottom. Because, look, 
when you go to a team and your big brothers are Kareem and Jamal Wilkes, who played at UCLA, both of those guys played for John Wooden, you know, Bob McAdoo, Mitch Kupchak, went to the university that I went to. They played for Dean Smith. You had Pat Riley, who played for uh, the infamous coach, Adolph Rupp, down in Kentucky. Magic Johnson came from Judd Heachco at Michigan State. So you had all these players. Jerry West was in the front office. Bill Sharman, uh, the great Bill Sharman, who still holds the record of 33 games in a row, uh, was our uh, president. So I had all this cushion and comfort around me. Um, and they, you know, I didn't even start, you know, I'll tell you a story. I, I, I showed up at the Lakers, you know, really confident, you know, I just won uh, a national championship. I was a number one pick. So normally the number one pick starts right away. He gets all the limelight. I knew that wasn't going to happen in Los Angeles, but I did expect to come in and earn you know, some playing time. And I, so I, I was thinking maybe I could start with these guys. So I was a power forward in college. So I go into training camp and I, you know, there's Kareem, you know, you're, you know, he's starting, there's magic. Jamal Wilkes was still uh, the small forward. I, you know, he was a starter. Norm Nixon was the other point guard. And then I saw Kurt Rambis, you know, and I looked at Kurt and I was like, I'm faster than he is. You know, I can score. He had these glasses on with duct tape, you know, holding them together. And he had all these elbow pads. And I was like, I can, I can get that position. That's what I was telling myself. I said, that's the position that I'm taking. Well, the first week of practice, Kurt Ramis showed me what a real NBA power forward is. I mean, he beat the crap out of me for 48 hours. I couldn't take it anymore. You know, anything inside that paint was like a war zone. And so I had to take my little ass and sit on the bench for almost two years, learn the game. I played behind Cooper. I played behind Bob McAdoo. I got some minutes. And I was averaging about 14 points my rookie year, but I wasn't taking Kurt Rambis' spot. And he let me know that right away. So coming to the Lakers was no pressure. You know, it was actually a blessing in disguise because I got a chance to learn the game. I love Kevin Durant's game. With the exception, I didn't shoot the three that much, but his inside game, his his 15 feet in, uh, his step back, the ability to shoot over people, his aggressiveness to the cup, you know, and finish, uh, and his ability to play defense on the other end. That was my forte. You know, we really didn't allow Magic to play uh, point guards. There's no way we were going to put Magic on Isaiah or Stockton because we needed Magic in the fourth quarter to run and run our offense. So. Byron Scott used to play, you know, uh, the point guards, and I would end up playing the Drexlers and the Dumars. But I would say Kevin Durant, with his length and his ability to go inside and out and his ball handling, you know, I, I, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm closer to him, you know. Um, and, but, but he's a player that I really enjoy watching.